Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Mariana. And I'm Tony. The fitness industry right now is not what it could be. It's become something built on unrealistic expectations, aesthetics, external validation, directing attention away from what actually matters. The bottom line is we're not trying to provide just another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by providing you with the knowledge and tools to give you confidence in applying the best possible training and nutrition into your own lives where today we are talking about all things recovery because no matter how hard you train in the gym if your body isn't recovering properly you will not make the progress you want to see oftentimes lack of recovery is a primary limiter of how much muscle you can actually gain and how lean you can get so we want to make a complete guide on recovery covering all different aspects of muscle soreness and overtraining the role different aspects of nutrition plays in recovery sleep and rest, and certain supplements that may help along the way. But before we get into all of that, as always, whatever platform you're listening on, go ahead and give us a five-star review if you haven't already. It's one of the best ways to support us, and we really appreciate it. You can also give us a follow on Spotify, and you can continue staying up to date, up to date on every single episode. Do it. And if you want more <laughs> after each episode, join us over on Premium for just five bucks a month, where you get a bonus episode every single Friday, where we're answering your individual questions questions. And last week, we even dropped our first ever complete training program this past Friday for free to all premium members with our 12 week push pull leg program. And just by being a fitness stuff premium member, you're entered in a $300 Legion supplement monthly giveaway monthly as in every single month sign up for that <laughs> is down in our show notes below check it out. I promise you won't be disappointed and shout out to our day ones, which I was actually kind of thinking of. How cool is that? Like we've had Legion's sponsored every single episode of this podcast From the ever. And we're on like 70 something, 80 something. Mm -hmm. It's been over a freaking year. And I was like, how many podcasts yeah. have the same sponsor for over a year? It just tickled my heart. But anywho, I have an update because I lied two weeks ago. I was dishonest two weeks ago. <laughs> I said I'd have a full review on the Sherbert pre-workout flavor, but it didn't get in until after last week's episode was shot. But I tried it. And I'm not going to joke. Like, hands down better than their bubblegum flavor they did like months ago that they sold out of best freaking I've flavor they that. have insane sherbet's great if you've been if you can question it try it second thing have you tried their protein cookies yet their chocolate chip cookies they just came out with them I, like last week i have not you always have all of the new drops i actually feel like i need to go order them right now i'm just on top but. of my game no they're okay it blew my mind because i want to set expectations i was a little scared i've talked about on here a few times before i'm not the biggest fan of their protein bars more of a texture thing, right? Like phenomenal mm -hmm. nutrition. I just wasn't a fan of the texture. So I was a little scared of a cookie because on the image, it looks incredible. I'm like, there's no mm -hmm. way it's that good. It has like 200 and something calories, 15 grams of protein and nine grams of prebiotic fiber. So I'm like, okay, nutrition's a little too good to be a cookie. I'm not gonna lie for that nutrition. The cookie was bomb. As a normal cookie, if you test it next to like a normal grandma's cookie, no, it's not well good. It's a protein cookie. I that's feel like you I'm have to have your expectations for. That, that's why I wanted to set it out for. This isn't the best cookie of all time, but for the nutrition, especially when you consider it to like a Lenny and Larry's cookie, which has like half the protein, more than twice the amount of calories, zero fiber. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is freaking incredible. But anywho, you can try those out. They dropped last Monday. And as always, if you use code FSPOD, that's FSPOD at checkout, you get 20% off your first order or double points every order after that. And we're going to put that in our show notes down below as well. Let's talk Ooh. about recovery. Maybe these protein cookies mm -hmm. will help with recovery. <laughs> Who freaking knows? I know what's, <laughs> did you say up late last night reading your book? I did. Oh my God. I actually, the, the past few nights I stayed up, but I'm not that tired. I stayed up until like two, but I've been going to bed oh. at 11. So I'm not going to do that tonight. Cause gosh, she was just telling me beforehand how she just got back into reading. Yes. And she's obsessed and she's read three – look how freaking big that book. She's like, I read three books I, on Sunday and then you showed me the book. I was like, how the f is that possible? Well, I read one book. I read one book and then I started a series. So this is the second book in a series that I'm reading. And I posted it on my stories and so many people – I don't know if any of you guys follow me on Instagram and, or one of them – but messaged me and said that I was going to fly through them and I'm flying through them. The Akhtar series, A Court of Thorns Dang. and Roses. If you're into fantasy – 
It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. And that, I needed a new hobby. I really did. I, I needed one. And so I'm really happy about it. <laughs> I just, I can't get into fiction books for whatever reason. I've tried so many times. I tried, I think the last one I tried was like Moby Dick. I was like, let me show you if I can get some Well, okay. I don't I'll... see like an image doesn't pop in my head. Like Karina was telling me, I, I was telling you this too. It's like a movie just starts playing when they start reading it. And I, I just see words. Like nothing yeah. plays in my head. That's why I'm more like nonfiction ish and i just can't get over that you need to so i'm the type of person i can't just read any book like i also have a hard time seeing things in my head if at all but that's why i've always liked fantasy because if it's a good writer they're gonna describe everything with such detail that you almost just like feel immersed in it rather than i don't completely i don't see it but i just feel like i'm there if that makes sense. okay that was a better explanation that makes a lot of sense that makes a yeah. lot of sense because I'm not even – I'm also – because I don't I, – I post a lot about books because I feel like I buy a new book like every single week and people are like, how do you read so freaking fast? I'm like, I don't read cover to cover. I, I also – I don't love like the self-help. I, oh, I, I do, but a, I don't. The only self-help I, book I have is Atomic Habits and I don't even consider that like – I just hate the title of – like the self-help category title because it sounds like woo-woo. Yeah. Some of these self-help quote-unquote books have completely well, those changed you don't my need life, to but, read cover to cover. Yeah. I was like, I feel like a lot of the time it's like one good idea just wrapped around hundreds of pages of book. And it's like one yeah. good idea with like just buried in anecdotes and all these things. I'll just skim through what I like. I don't think I've read a book cover to cover in like a year and a half since Anthony DeMille and the book. Yeah, it, it had been me. It had been so long for me. So, so you got to read fantasy books you want the whole plot i want to know every single detail it's absolutely consumed to me and it's the best thing ever if you think about getting into reading let's start at again FS book club fs book club i, that. I know i'm like I, I don't know what to do but it's also like i don't go to the bars i don't i don't know what to do i'm 26 and i literally don't know what to do socially so it's come to this i'm picking up a book and this is so exciting like what what is happening i think we but. should we should start a goodreads fitness stuff account if you're not if you're a reader and you don't have a goodreads you're not a reader I have a that was the initial, I think, when I had a Hinge profile. I was like, don't add me on Instagram. Add me on Goodreads. It's like a social media for books. It's kind of cool. We'll start yeah. at FS Pod Book Club to come <laughs> in the future near you. But first, got to talk about recovery. Let's talk yeah. about it. Which I was a little shocked when we – I know I say this every week, but I'm shocked that we haven't done an, a full episode breaking down recovery before. We've mentioned how important it is how many millions of times, mm -hmm. and we haven't actually done a full episode on it yet. Yeah. I know. I think we we've only been doing this for a year. So I just feel like more things are going to come up. There's so much to cover, but there's also like I find with our audience like what you guys really like to listen to too is smaller topics like within a larger issue that mm. we kind of dissect. We've talked about recovery before. We talk about protein a lot. Like there's things that will bring up a lot, but it's nice when they can fall under like a more specific broad like category almost, but totally this, this right. one deserves its whole episode. Totally right. Because how many times that I've run into this wall by myself, I almost think the only way that you figure this part out and how important recovery is by working too hard until you're almost forced to realize. It. Yeah. Or, or you realize you're forced to, because how many times, I mean, when it comes to wanting to make more progress, I know I've been here. I think most people have, or if not are almost on their way there. So maybe we're helping prevent you from running into that wall with this. But when you're wanting to make more progress, and especially when it comes to muscle growth and fat loss, I feel like so many people just lean into doing more, more everything, more weight training, better exercises, more cardio, harder dieting, more supplements. They want more, 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 but not when it comes to rest and recovery, because that requires doing less. And I feel like that's the final graduation in a step almost is when you start to realize sometimes, especially when it comes to like the physical training aspect, sometimes less is more mm -hmm. when it comes to this. And I think we're going to cover a lot of different aspects today, like Mariana covered in the intro about what different aspects come into it, because it doesn't matter how hard you train. If your body can't recover from that, you will not make the progress you want to see when it comes to losing fat or building muscle. And I know you and I were just talking before we hit record I feel like people usually only almost attribute this to building muscle and not losing fat, yeah. even though I would say they're equally important, equally necessary. Mm -hmm. No, I completely agree. And again, it's just this idea that you have to like rest is for the week. And I know it's like, people are like, no, that's not true, but it's not expressed like that anymore. But 
I think it's more so this anxiety that you get once you do start going to the gym that what's going to happen if I don't go? Like where my game, I'm going to lose my gains if I'm not, I don't know, if I'm not training 24 seven or pushing yeah. myself super hard or, you know, I'm not going to listen to my, it's also the, I think the privilege of being young and healthy too, that can seep in. I feel like um, the younger, every, that's where it starts with everyone being young Yeah, is yeah. when they want that more. So. It kind of comes to every aspect of life too, even in work. Yeah the whole less is more concept, it's hard to grasp. And I think that actually brings up a good point when it comes to training is because when you're in the gym and like you just said, you feel like you're missing out because you're not in the gym or doing these things. It's because you have a mountain of progress that you want to make. You that you want to be in the future is probably very far off from the you you are now. So you're Mm -hmm. like, I've got so much to do. I feel like I'm wasting time not doing it. I remember even when I started, it was a couple years after starting Bloom, this company, And it started to grow. This is like, I think early 2021. And I think everyone runs into this when it comes to work and you're almost forced to kind of realize how important rest is. But when I was working like 70, 80 hour work weeks, I was constantly behind. And that's why I had to keep working and working. The idea of doing less Mm -hmm. to accomplish more, it just doesn't make sense in your head. Like when it's like, I've got this list of a hundred things to do. I need to stay up until eight or nine o'clock doing it or even later. But then the idea of saying, what if you just didn't? And like, what if you actually went to bed early? Or what yeah. if you just took it off and went and spent time with people you actually like? It, it seems backwards. <laughs> it, yeah, it just seems backwards though, doesn't it? It's like you're running a race and you're like, sitting down will get me closer to that finish line over there. It doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. logically. Yeah. But then you start to realize how important the quality of work you're doing and the productivity you have. I mean, that's where I think I finally got to a point where I was working for months of just breaking myself down. I was exhausted. I couldn't sleep. I was like just a mess. I was missing the gym, working through the gym on my cell phone while I was there too. And I remember even it it just got to this point where I think I booked like a staycation, like an Airbnb of like 30 minutes away. I did not bring my laptop and I just, I had one rule. I said, I cannot look at social media, anything on my phone, essentially outside of like texts, Mm -hmm. if I need to like communicate with someone. I remember coming back that Monday after that weekend off and I got more work done on that Monday than I think I could have done in the previous entire week because I was refreshed coming into it. I think the mental burnout aspect, but when it comes to training, it also includes the physical aspect. It's it's both too, because you run into that like you're going to reach it too. If you're going to the gym every day for two hours a day, one day you're not going to be loving it as much and you're not going to feel like you can put as much into it as you used to because everything like that catches up to you. So yeah, I I've mean, been we there. Were, we were but... talking about this early on when you were younger, what's the most frequently you ever trained throughout the week? I remember when I was like 17, 18, I worked in a gym. I know I was doing seven days a week, like no days off. Oh, in my late when teens, I was twenties, which this is so counterintuitive. But when I was playing volleyball, it was like, I was training because I wanted to go to college and like, I remember it it being the off season because my coach would have never let this happen. But in the off season, which was really like a short time period, but I was in the gym every single day because I was so worried about, I don't know. I was just worried about not being, I needed something while I wasn't playing that made me better, so to say. And I was just going seven days a week. And yeah, I feel like we all get there. And at that point too, though, it was probably for this too. You love it. Like you kind of use it to oh, escape yeah. negative feelings. You escape work, the stress, everything just disappears. Everything feels good at the gym. So when you first discover that and how good it makes you feel, you're like, I want to live here. I, mm-hmm. I got the job in the gym because I loved it so much. I was like, I don't have to yeah. deal with any negative problems. It's all great. And it can make some decent progress. And when you're younger, you do have a little bit more flexibility because we're going to talk about when it comes to how much training you can really handle. Cause that's what it comes down to is can your body recover from what you're doing? Everyone's recovery profile is completely different based on not mm-hmm. just one genetics, but how much you're pouring into each of these different aspects of recovery that we're going to talk about the training, the nutrition, the mobility, things like that. And then I think this is the biggest key for it because a lot of younger people will see people like Seabum or Phil Heath, these Olympians, and they're in the gym for two, three hours a day, six, seven days a week, sometimes even doing two a days, leading up to the show. And they're like, I, I want to look like him. I got to do this. And I think that's the, the biggest aspect of steroids that people don't understand. Because yeah. in that aspect, you need to be on PEDs to compete at that level. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. But 
I think it's under, misunderstood where people just think steroids make you bigger, make you stronger. The biggest aspect that, of why bodybuilders take these steroids are, is that it, it increases your ability to recover faster, quicker, more efficiently. So like the people that look the best aren't the people who are just taking steroids. If you just inject testosterone, there are studies done that you'll gain a little bit of muscle without changing a thing. A small, but meaning like enough to be meaningful amount of muscle, Yeah. but it doesn't transform your physique. If I could tell you how many people I've met doing steroids who, who their physique just looks like trash, it would surprise the heck out of you. I, I think it goes to show too, if you're still on them and you're going through seasons, like you cycle with steroids, right? Kind of. Yeah. Uh, it depends, but a lot of people do. At least, yeah. but it's like the bodies that people how your body will look if you're still on some form of steroid and not training as hard as you used to. And that's the biggest piece of why steroids work is it just increases your body's ability to recover. And that's why these Olympians can train longer, train harder because their body can recover so much quicker because that's ultimately Wait, but this. That's illegal in the Olympics. Olympian, sorry, like uh, like Mr. Olympia, not like the. Uh, oh my God, like I'm dead. Olympia. Sorry, I'm... I might've misspoken in, in how I said it, but that's what I meant is Mr. <laughs> Olympia competition, things like that. But Oh, okay, okay. But that's the biggest aspect is because it allows them to do more because that's ultimately when we give, I think last week in the PPO episode, we always give these volume recommendations for how many hard sets per muscle group you can handle per week for optimal growth. The reason why it tops out at like 20, 25 hard sets isn't because more than that in stimulus can't give you more muscle growth. It's that your body can't recover from more than that. But if you're on PEDs, if you're on steroids, it can recover from 25, from 30 plus sets per week. That's the main aspect of steroids is it just improves your body's ability to recover that I think a lot of people miss out on. Now, when it comes to recovery, I think most people think of soreness, muscle soreness, DOMS. Mm -hmm. We've all been there. You do a leg day. You can't get out of bed. You can't get off the toilet. But when people think recovery, they generally think from muscle soreness. And that is a big piece of it. And I think we, we went over this in one of our AMAs and premium a couple of weeks ago uh, about exactly what it is, because we've all heard of this DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. It's that pain that just develops in your muscle one to two days after a workout. And it typically disappears within four to maybe seven days max. But where exactly muscle soreness comes from still is not exactly known. I don't think people fully realize that. It's not known for a fact where it comes from. I think a lot of people used to think it was lactic acid buildup because that's lactic acid is usually where you feel that burn when you're actually training. So people yeah. thought, oh, that must be from what muscle soreness comes from. This just doesn't make sense. Lactic acid builds up during training, but it's cleared out after about one hour max after your training session's over. So the fact that you don't get sore until the next day, that theory doesn't really make sense. The most promising thought is that soreness is caused by the actual small tears made to the muscle through weight training, that micro trauma. And this is a, a large degree of why you don't build muscle in the gym. You build it out of the gym because you're literally breaking your muscle down in the gym, even though that micro trauma, as we now know, is not what is attributed to muscle growth either. Now, the biggest argument against this one is kind of the same thing is if it were the case that these micro tears were what caused us to be sore, then why would it not start immediately following your workout when those tears are the freshest? Why would it wait one or two days to start feeling sore? And there's some mechanisms that kind of explain that. But the one thing that we do know about soreness is it's a result of novel or new stimulus, not necessarily mm -hmm. effective stimulus. And I think that's the most important thing. And why you like when you do abs once a month, you get sore until you can't do it. Same thing is I'm not a big runner. I'll do some sprints several times through the week, but nothing longer than a minute. If after this episode, I just went out and ran a marathon, I would be sore for an entire week, mm -hmm. sore for an entire week, but I wouldn't. That be... was the last time I was really sore, like really, really sore and couldn't <laughs> walk like this past winter when I just decided to start running like five miles. And I was like, I feel like I want to kill someone. This was yeah. so painful. And it's novel stimulus because marathon runners, they don't get that sore from running a marathon. No. But since it's brand new to me, it does. But you have to think about this too. I'll be sore for a week, but I wouldn't gain any muscle because it's not providing the stimulus needed for hypertrophy, for muscle growth. It's not being productive. So there's soreness does not equate to a productive workout. And this is oftentimes why the first workout back after you take like a vacation or some time off 
the first workout back usually results in a lot more soreness. Or if you're doing like a new training program, that's my favorite thing to go through with clients is when they've been working out for months and then they try my workout and they're like, oh my God, I was so sore. It was such a good workout. I could toot my own horn and be like, yeah, because I build a killer workout. But it's like, no, <laughs> it's just because it's new stimulus. It's real. And if you want to test this out yourself, you can even try, if you usually work out with like lower reps, heavier weight, do a couple workouts with like 15 to 20 reps close to failure and look at how sore you are the next day. Same thing, if you do high reps, lightweight, do a couple workouts with higher weight, lower rep and watch how sore you are the next day just because it's new stimulus. That doesn't mean it's productive, it's just new. And after a week or two of training in that new style, you just won't be as sore anymore. Or at least that's how it should be. Now, the best thing you can do to for muscle soreness, I think that's where we wanna start because that's not everything that we're gonna have to do with recovery as you're gonna learn, but the best thing you can do for muscle soreness, the best things, hands down, it's not another supplement. It's not an ice bath or a special stretching technique from TikTok or that weird yoga instructor on there. It's to move. It's to move. Move your body. That's what it is. And I, I became even more interested in this because it's actually to a higher intensity, I think, than most people really realize after watching and talking to Stan, efforting more about it because he trains with high-level athletes. He's incredible if you don't know who he is. We had him on the show, but the audio got trashed, so he never actually got published here. But Essentially, think about it like this. Blood flow carries the nutrients needed to the muscle in order for it to repair, right? So everything that you're going to eat, and Mariana is going to go deep into nutrition next. Your muscle needs those nutrients to grow. Blood flow carries those nutrients needed to the muscle in order for it to repair. The only thing that meaningfully increases blood flow is movement, specifically where you're sore, I think is the most important part. So if you're sore after leg day, doing some moderate intensity sprints on the recumbent bike, doing some weighted sled pushes, walking up a few slide flights of stairs, even doing some lightweight, that's correct, weighted goblet squats, if you're able to do so. But the worst thing that you can do is just sit and not move all day at your desk because it hurts. Mm -hmm. That is the worst thing you can possibly do. It's not an ice bath. Like I told you, Stan's, my favorite quote from Stan in this is whatever you're doing for recovery, is it done to you or is it done by you? right? Is it an ice bath, a compression wrap? Is it Advil and Tylenol or a supplement? Is that done to you or is it done by you through movement, through actual getting your heart rate up, right? Those are some of the most powerful things because I know if my legs are sore, the thought of doing more squats sounds idiotic, but try it. It's the freaking, it's key, it's why which is usually the hardest thing to do. Never see any marathon, half marathon. You will, there's at least like a mile at minimum a mile of walking until you get to like the end you have to walk that you're required to walk until you get to like the water the place where you can actually exit because that's where you see the most injuries are from those who just stop after running for a prolonged period of time really? and you don't move yeah mm -hmm. dang even that after i didn't know that oh that's yeah. kind of scary yeah i remember the first half marathon i did and we had to walk a mile after until we could like get out of the exits and it's all gated off like you you have to walk you, but it's important yeah. movements and we covered this Movement. in the sauna and ice bath episode because what what is the biggest claim people say about ice baths cryo chambers it helps speed up recovery and honestly there's very little data to actually support this and honestly there's even some that shows it does more harm than good because think about this acute inflammation is a good thing People like to scaremonger that word inflammation. All an ice bath is doing is it's reducing inflammation. It's reducing blood flow to the area that needs it the most oftentimes. That's where this can actually get in, in trouble. And what we covered in that episode is that's why if you do an ice bath after your weight training workout, you essentially blunt your body's ability to gain any muscle, right? We cut, that was the coolest part I thought of that episode is it's not just not doing good, it's hurting you in terms of actually making progress when it comes to this. And just getting your heart rate up and even using loads if you have to, but going on walks throughout the day, going up a few flights of stairs, doing things with the muscle groups that are sore or that you just worked, all right? Some of the most important things you can do, just get your heart rate up. That's mm -hmm. all you got to do, right? Get your heart rate up to avoid that afterwards. I was also going to say too, and we're going to talk about a lot of this, is things that you can do beforehand and doing some like actual strengthening, like joint strengthening movements, where I would say, honestly... 
I would say just instead of us breaking it down, follow people like Ben Patrick or Knees Over Toes Guy or yeah. Stan Efferding. These people that have phenomenal strengthening exercises for your knees, for your ankles, for your shoulders. So you don't have to recover from an injury. You can prevent it in the first place, right? Like I, I have a full mobility and recovery day planned in my routine where I'll do like a four day technical split. But the fifth day I'm in the gym for an hour working on mobility recovery because I know how important that is long term not getting rid of soreness, but just working on it long term. It's so important. Ben Patrick's incredible. If you don't follow, we oh, we should get him on the podcast. That actually I know. Be cool. I that know. actually, be, why are we not? Let's reach out to him. Somehow. Now that's when it comes down to muscle soreness. Now let's talk about the actual aspects of recovery. As far as I think the big ones are going to be the nutrition aspects, the training aspects and sleep. Those are what we're going to yeah. cover. And I think nutrition is one that I see more often than not being a huge thorn in the side. I don't even think yeah. that I said that right, but you know what I'm talking about. A huge yeah. Achilles heel in most people is the nutrition aspect. Yeah. And I see it more being an issue due to people overcomplicating it than, especially if you're in the gym, most people now kind of have the understanding, okay, nutrition's important. It is. What I'm eating is important if I am, should be fueling my workouts, but the overcomplication or just completely neglecting it. So I see two mm. ends of the spectrum. Um, and it's important to understand what happens to your body during exercise and why these components of nutrition are an integral piece to any fitness goal you may have, whether you're trying to build muscle, whether you have your marathon related goal, whether what you're trying to lose fat, these main principles are all still important. How you implement them is going to change based off of your goal, but it mm. is still universally important. So what happens to our body during exercise? Tony already mentioned our Proteins in the muscles getting broken down and damaged. Fluid and electrolytes get lost in our sweat. Glycogen stores in the muscle and your liver decrease. They can even deplete from your muscle entirely with high intensity prolonged endurance exercise. So the main goals of post-workout nutrition are to replenish that glycogen, decrease protein breakdown, and increase protein synthesis. And Yes, I say that regardless of whether or not you're trying to build muscle. Even if you're not trying to build yeah. muscle, you still want to decrease protein breakdown and increase protein synthesis. And there are these four R's. There's a four R framework when it comes to nutritional strategies to optimize post-exercise recovery. That can put this all into perspective. Rehydrate, refuel, repair, and rest. We're going to cover all of these throughout the episode. And I, different components can apply to things beyond nutrition. Rehydrate. Um, Refuel, repair, rest. I, I just love yes. al alliteration. Yeah. You know that. Get that tied. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. Um, and it can help simplify it. Um, it, it remembers the big it, rocks. What's yes. important here? Don't get lost mm -hmm. in the sauce. Like, okay, rehydrating, refueling, repairing, rest. I like yes. that. I, I like something that easily helps you like bring it back down. Is this important or is it not? Does it fall into these? No, that's yeah. not as important. I mm -hmm. love it. Yeah. So I want to start with protein because when it comes to nutrition, I would say that this is, if I could pick one as the most important I would say protein, um, but again, exercise triggers the breakdown of muscle protein. So the rate at which this happens does depend on the exercise and your level of training. So breaking, it's still going to happen when you're exercising, but muscle protein synthesis is increased slightly or unchanged after resistance workouts. So while your protein breakdown increases dramatically. So this is, we're talking mm. about resistance workouts. That is so important to remember that we are breaking down the protein within our muscle. That is something we want to prevent from happening afterwards. So the relationship between those two parameters, the rate of muscle protein synthesis and breakdown represents the metabolic basis for muscle growth and also just Reco how you recover, recover in general. So I know that we're talking about recovery here, but this principle of muscle growth is still kind of intertwined when we're talking about nutrition, because yeah. if you are not prioritizing 
these principles of muscle growth, you're also not prioritizing nutrition for recovery. And that might sound confusing, but it can kind of make sense of it all when we talk about how protein relates to your overall ability to recover. So protein synthesis is stimulated and protein is broken. Protein breakdown is suppressed when you consume the right amount of nutrients after exercise. So how the critical role that the nutrient nutrition part plays in optimizing this process in preventing how much protein mm. you're breaking down is where you see that overlap. So yeah, protein's important. And some people are going to be like, hey, well, how much protein do you need for recovery? What's the best amount? When should I be having it? And because maximal muscle protein synthesis is key for optimal adaptation to the stimulus and recovery from heavy training exercises, the amount of protein is so heavily researched in the literature and has been for so long. Mm -hmm. But even I'd say in the last decade, more so leaning towards the realization that it's not about the timing of this protein intake. It's not about the specific window that we have to be also known as the anabolic window. My anabolic have, window? <laughs> that we have to be getting in this protein. It is much more so about how much protein am I getting in on a daily basis? And am I getting protein at some point after my workout? Am I still getting in at some point? That's important. But- there has been a lot of, I would say, not conflict anymore, but in the past, it was really a heavily debated topic yeah. of there's this special window where growth and recovery are enhanced. Yes. It was 30 minutes, then it was 60, and then people were like, no, it's two hours. Like, it just was ever-changing. Yeah. Well, it's because you always – I think it's it, – uh, this is where it was when Tony was 18, and I, if I forgot my protein powder in my Ziploc baggie – to drink after my workout when I was 18, I would almost be like, I just ruined and wasted my entire workout. What am I doing? <laughs> but I think it's because it's such a picture when you just see every bodybuilder, at least in that age, slamming a protein shake right after their workout or towards the end of their workout. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, that's always in their hand was a protein shake. Yeah. Uh, and it makes sense. Yeah. Logically, it does make sense to think that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just broke down your muscles, so it would want protein, right? Like it logically, it makes sense, but you're right. Like just with the massive amount of data that we now have about it, we start to realize like the, the timing is not nearly as important as the total. Yeah. And a lot of the flaws, and again, research is ever evolving, but after acute increases, it, you see acute increases in muscle protein synthesis directly following training with the ingestion of protein. So looking at individuals instantly within that 30 minutes, getting some protein in you will see these acute rises in muscle protein synthesis, but the effect that that has in terms of recovery and muscle growth is no different compared to those who are having it five hours after or the, and they're still getting the same amount of protein in their day. So yeah. that's what we've seen over time. And we can't make those judgment calls based off of these acute jumps, it's more so, okay, how is this affecting overall muscle growth and recovery in the long term? So yeah. there has been this conclusion from the American College of Sports Medicine, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, that around 20 to 25 grams of high quality protein is sufficient for maximal muscle protein synthesis after exercise, following exercise at some point in your day. But if you are a trained athlete, you might need more. Um, so that's more so for the general population, mm -hmm. but it's much more impactful to determine how much protein you need as a whole in your day and make sure you're hitting that and just having at some point a high protein meal after yeah. exercise. That's it, yeah. Most which I was part. like, that's because the, it's the mechanism versus outcome thing again. It's like the me it makes sense that you'd want to raise muscle protein synthesis directly after a workout when your muscle protein breakdown is the highest. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's cool that we now have the research to step back and say, okay, let's mm -hmm. test it, right? Let's separate groups where they're doing that and they're not, as long as we're hitting the totals, oh, we see the same results. Great. And I was like, that's, I think the main thing too, is if you're spreading it out through the day to really optimize how often it is, if you're eating protein two, three, four hours before your workout, your blood amino acid levels are going to be high enough during your workout. So you really don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I was talking to you right beforehand. I'm like, since I wake up and I go fasted to the gym, I haven't had protein in 
probably by the time I eat breakfast, like almost 10 hours, then I, I try and get protein quicker or sooner than later after my workout, just because I know that I haven't had some in a while, but mm -hmm. it still comes down to that total number, which is important. Yeah. I think the total number too, we've talked about, we used to have a protein calculator in our bio. I know I still do on my socials, but I'll, we should almost just pin that around. But yeah, we'll put a nice little link in the comments down below to figure out how much total is solid there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just some protein rich foods for muscle recovery. The first I'm just going to get, this isn't a food, it's a supplement. So let's put this in its own category, but obviously whey protein supplements, just protein in general, some sort of protein powder. Mm -hmm. But if we're talking about if you did want something post-workout, a whey protein isolate is going to be the gold standard just because it is mm -hmm. rapidly absorbed. It's the most quickly absorbed protein powder. So if you're looking for- uh, Protein period too. Like not even just powder yeah, form, protein, but just protein Yeah, period. compared to- yeah. yeah, yeah. So that would be one, unless if you're just slamming- meat all the time and you have no problem. Sometimes it just makes people, and that's great. Just it just makes people's meat. lives. <laughs> slamming just meat. Slamming I don't meat. know. <laughs> it's just, Mariana, it's just slamming meat. <laughs> oh my God. Shush. I didn't even think about how bad that just sounded. <laughs> I just picture like bodybuilders just like having their chicken <laughs> all throughout meat. the day. No, I know. They're slamming, slamming meat. meat. Okay. Other, other sources of protein that are great. Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, white fish, or even salmon lean beef or chicken, lean chicken or turkey. If you are a vegan, vegetarian, tofu or tempeh, they are a complete protein. So that is what I would recommend first. Tuna is also great. Protein bars, again, would I consider that like a whole food? No, but that's a quick, easy option. And they also are combined with carbohydrates. So protein bars can be a great post-workout yeah. option because the combination of protein and carbs has been found to help enhance that process, which I'm going to talk a little bit about more when I get into carbs. Yeah. I think that's mainly protein without getting too into the nitty gritty yeah. of it. Well, I actually, a thought popped up when you were talking about muscle protein breakdown and synthesis a little bit, because I, I don't know if you remember, I, I remember this when I was just getting into training, just past NASM, CPT. This was also years ago. I don't think it's still like this, but I remember it was a very common thought previously, like years ago to really think, and I think still people believe it, that muscle growth is caused by muscle protein breakdown. How it was explained to me by my trainer when I was 18 years old was during your muscle, you're breaking down, making micro trauma, micro tears in your muscle. And the protein you eat fills in those tears to make your muscle bigger over time. But we now know that's not the main driver of muscle growth. It's actually even debated if it's even a driver of muscle growth, period. Where we know mechanical tension is the pretty much almost single driver along with a little bit of muscle damage and cellular fatigue, but mechanical tension is what drives muscle growth period. So I think that's where a lot of people get confused because a lot of the things we talk about when it comes to sleep, even supplements like whey protein that limit muscle protein breakdown during training, like, wait a sec, isn't that the whole purpose of training in the first place is to break it down? It's like, no, if you can actually limit that to a sense, you'll be able to have more endurance, more strength, which will give you more mechanical tension, allow you to provide that much, much better over time. And I, I also just wanted to mention if you are in the listening and you're in the endurance camp, maybe that's mainly what you do. Endurance training, it's still essential to preserve your muscle. So you might not be trying to build muscle, but maybe you're at a point where you do cross train, you are a strength training, you should be at least if you are an endurance athlete to mm -hmm. prevent injury and have hold on to your lean muscle mass. But a huge component of that is making sure you're not losing your lean muscle mass. You want to make sure that that breakdown, muscle breakdown is not exceeding that muscle protein synthesis. Talk to me about my favorite food group, carbs. Carbs, carbs, carbs. I love carbs. carbs. Carbohydrates. I feel like carbs because of the stigma too. People just don't Talk about how important they are unless if you're using them for your training or you're really into that endurance piece. I just feel like they, they're – Because they've been demonized really for so like People yeah. paint them as the devil. The whole yeah. insulin's the devil, carb, sugar, they're the worst thing. It's that whole thing, it's which crazy. I think we're finally getting out of actually. Yeah, me too. That was a bad too. few years, but we're finally getting out mm -hmm. of it. But I think that's why people don't openly talk about it as much. It's because yeah. general population still thinks carbs equal bad, it's, which yeah. sucks. But they're so, so important. They're so important. Even the people that would say, okay, I know carbs are important. will still later be like, oh, I got to make a healthy choice. I'm not going to eat the bread or the, and the, the carb yeah. source, they automatically assume is unhealthy. 
that's my favorite thing to talk about because people still don't even realize the carbs you eat essentially they don't get stored as body fat they can't it, it's like trying to fit like the shapes together when the little kids game a star into a circle hole it doesn't fit right yeah. like there is there is a process called de novo lipogenesis that it's an endogenous pathway that converts excess sugar starch carbs into fatty acids it is not efficient at all like the carbs that you eat get stored in your muscle and liver but mostly in your muscle tissue like people don't realize it it doesn't and really can't get stored there's body fat. I, I forget the latest numbers. It was b below what, two to 3% yeah. of total carbs. I think in most cases can be even stored as body fat. So people have this fear that carbs are making them and fat when they legitimately can't. Like I mentioned earlier, your body's glycogen stores are used as fuel during your exercise. So glycogen, that is the storage form of glucose. That is your stored glucose that you are going to tap into to use during exercise. And that decreases during exercise and simply put ingesting them after a workout helps replenish them they're they're important that's why they're important carbohydrates post workout help the body release insulin which in turn helps restore the glycogen stores <laughs> that were used during any training session so that's important and i mentioned briefly that protein bars can be great because you can see that that protein and carbs work together synergistically to increase the body's rate of glycogen storage. Carbs do this job even better when paired with protein. And that is something that I find so fascinating in the research. And I was so fascinated by this when I went to school and learned about it. Sugar can be really helpful. Like carbs are sugar and it can be really helpful in the recovery process. And that's why they can have their own supporting role. I call it a, su a supporting mm -hmm. role in muscle growth. Most critical factor is not necessarily nutrient timing, but just ensuring you're eating the right foods and you're eating enough, eating enough food, making yeah. sure that you are not under fueling and going into all of your workouts under fueled. That is going to kick you down so hard in the long term. And again, yes, eating enough protein and carbs for it based off of your goals. But in general, you need to be eating enough food. If you're on a 1200 calorie diet, you're not going to be getting enough protein in on this 1200 calorie diet when you're in the gym two hours every single day. Sorry. That's, that's no, that's the happen. biggest thing I see because people often terms think of recovery in terms of muscle. And they wonder why like the lower they cut their calories and the lower they'll hit a plateau and it mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. It's because you're doing the same amount of training, if not more, but you're giving your body less fuel to recover with and you just, you're under recovered. You're chronically mm -hmm. under recovered and we're going to get to that in like the overtraining aspect. But that's the biggest thing I see with dieters. They don't get the whole calories in versus calories out thing because yes, it still makes sense, but it's not just black and white. It's not as easy is cutting your calories lower because that's going to interfere with how well your body can recover. Yeah. And it's insane how much better people feel. You've probably had clients like this. I know I've had even one more recently too, but when we actually work their calories back up to maintenance through a reverse or even go a little higher and they see how much more natural energy they have through the day, their lifts are all skyrocketing, not from eating in a massive surplus, but just about eating how much they're supposed to be eating. And they're not gaining weight, but their strength is increasing their energy because they're also just eating more. You move more through the day. Like mm -hmm. your knee naturally increases the more you eat, like very yeah. co like closely related. But that's the biggest thing I see when it comes to fat loss is under eating. People don't understand that how important under eating can be in getting in the way of your recovery. Mm -hmm. Such a missed aspect. Yeah. yeah. We know that. We know that. Now, nutrition is important. Arguably one of the most important factors, if not the most important factor of recovering. So if you can nail that down, you're already leaps and bounds ahead of everywhere else. Now, mm -hmm. we're going to briefly talk about the training aspect, the recovery aspect there, and the sleep aspect, which I think is probably up there on top as well. Now, the two aspects of training we want to talk about are one, load management and overtraining. Overtraining is a massive one, I think, in this community. And two is how to implement at like off days, recovery days, active recovery days, and deload weeks. Deloads are a big one. I know we've briefly touched on before, but just giving a little more detail there. Now, what exactly is overtraining? This is where the more is better approach. It works until it doesn't, essentially. Mm -hmm. right? Overtraining is once your training exceeds your body's ability to recover from it. Right. Results don't just stop moving forward, but they even move backwards. And this point's different for every single person based on how much they pour into this, their genetics, if they're using PEDs, 
different steroids, but the seven biggest signs that you're overtraining. I think this is where everyone needs to look because they always question, am I overtraining? Am I under recovering? What is it? These seven biggest signs that you're overtraining, and I've been on each and every one of them, and they're huge red flags, but it's easy to look past them, is one, you struggle to finish your workouts. It's just brutal to even make them through in the first place, right? The same workouts that you might have been able to kill before, you're struggling making them to the end without taking exercises out or lightening the load. Two, you're losing strength and endurance instead of building it. These things are going in the wrong direction. If your sleep quality sucks, if you're fatigued and lethargic throughout the day, if you feel depressed, this is actually a huge one of overtraining is if you have massive feelings of depression, I think everyone hits this wall from overtraining. And it just goes to show how complex something like that can be. But it is a very common uh, sign that you are overtraining. If aches, pains, injuries, if they continue to pop up, those small but stress and overuse injuries come up, my elbow pain, my back pain, my knee pain, if those things are always constantly there, you might be overtraining under recovering. Another big one, overtraining suppresses your immune system. So if you're getting sick more frequently, big red flag. If you always have a constant little cold or something nagging at you here or there, or once a month you're getting sick, your immune system's fighting something. It's not having a time to recover. That's a big one. I don't think most people look at it, but these are all signs that there is a systemic imbalance between work and recovery that needs that this, to be addressed. This is also, I would say probably all of these could be signs that you're under fueling too. Exactly. That's where I'm like this, this whole recovery. So it could be overtraining, could be under recovering. Yeah. They almost go synonymous. Like you could be overtraining or you could be under recovering. Oftentimes it's a little bit of both. You want to find that sweet spot in the middle. Yeah. But equally, you could be under recovering, under eating, over training. It could be a lot of these things. But yeah. these are all signs that you do not want to ignore. And mm -hmm. this is generally, I think, when it comes from over training specifically, not under recovering, mm -hmm. if you're spending more than six hours a week with hard weight training, the more you go over that limit is usually when you start to see more and more over training. If you're not using PEDs or steroids right? That's an hour a day, six days a week. If you're spending more than that, you just don't need to be. And that's one thing. If you are taking three to five to six minutes, if you're chilling in the gym, if you're just resting for five minutes, but that's one thing. But yeah. if you are training hard for more than six hours a week in the gym weights, I wouldn't be surprised if you were noticing some of those things above another one of those. And why we have those hard set limits. If you're doing more than 20 hard sets per muscle group per week, you're probably giving that muscle too much I'd rather jump out a window thinking about that, like makes me in knowing just how many people do that too. It's tough. I, well, and that's why it's important to think like over 20 hard sets, because I think people, a yeah. lot of people will have like 40 sets on their glutes, but they're nowhere close to failure. They're nowhere near the intensity or weight that they could be. But <laughs> this leads us to taking days off. Now, this is where I was saying in the beginning, when I first started working out, I wanted to live in the gym. And I had a little bit of forgiveness because I was younger and I could almost do that a little bit more, but I was not making as much progress as I could have been. I think we talked about this early on. I think over the last 10 years, I started out lifting like seven days a week. I eventually said, okay, I'm going to take one day off. I'm going to go six days a week, then down to five. And I think about two years ago is when I finally went down to four days a week. And that's where I found my sweet spot where I was making the most progress. My lifts were incredible. I was not being bogged down by injury. I didn't need deloads very often. Four days a week is where I was making optimal progress compared to five or six. So many people don't understand. A lot of the times less is more, right? I, I honestly would say I, it's really hard for me to say that you can make optimal progress when it comes to gain training more than five days per week. If those are longer, like real big training sessions, if you're doing shorter sessions, that's one thing. But if you're spending more than an hour, hour and a half in the gym, more than five days a week, I would say you're probably much better off pulling back because of how much higher quality your sets will be, your workouts will be. That's what I noticed the most is I was getting so much more out of each of those four workouts compared to going five or six days, even though I wanted to be there. My strength was through the freaking roof. That's where it was. And that was for my individual recovery profile. A lot of people might be better at five, some maybe even three where I've seen work for the most people. But that leads us to this talk of deloads where we haven't done an episode on deloads, but I think we did a and a a while ago. Yeah, we did. Um, premium with them. And essentially, we're not going to spend too much time because we talked about it a lot over there. But 
a deload essentially it's an intentional time period where you significantly de decrease your workload so your body can recover and bounce back stronger than before so usually it's referred to as a deload week where there, and we'll go over three different kinds real quick and usually how frequently you want to take them but there are three types of deloading one is called a load deload i don't like the name because it's load deload. it sounds weird but load deload this is where for one week in your training program you're doing the same volume, so the same sets, reps, and exercises, but you cut the weight by about 30 to 50%. So it's meant to be a low intensity week, meaning you're not working anywhere close to failure. If I normally bench press three sets of three for 315, I'm doing three sets of three for 200. A lot less weight just going through the motions, because again, movement is how your body recovers, right? So you're just doing it, but without actually breaking down muscle. So there's a load deload. There is a volume style deload, meaning for the same week, you're usually keeping the same amount of weight. So the same intensity when it comes to weights, you're just cutting down the workload in sets and reps, meaning you cut the sets you're doing by about 30 to 50%. So if I was doing three or four sets of bench, now I'm doing one or two sets of bench this week. And you're doing about two to four fewer reps than normal. So not taking things close to failure, but you're still giving yourself that heavy weight, that's usually more common in strength goals and strength athletes. So you can stay used to having that much weight on your body without actually causing the damage needed to recover. And then one that I'm honestly more of a fan of is the selective deload, meaning you reduce your volume and intensity on a single exercise or select exercises, more normally like compound exercises, like your squats, deadlifts, bench, overhead press. So you're still doing the rest of the workout at a normal intensity, but you're selectively taking certain movements down a notch, especially the compound ones, just because you're using so much of your body, so much of your muscle. Mm -hmm. It's nice to give those a break. And the biggest question I get, I don't know about you, is how often do we need a deload? And let me tell you this, plan your deload in advance. 95% of people who use deloads don't use them correctly. They don't plan it out and no. stick to it they wait until they get injured or they wait until they need it to do it. The whole point of a deload is so you don't need to take breaks ever. So you don't need injury breaks. You don't need recovery breaks. That's the point. So pick a date that you're going to do it. And going into the deload, you can be like, why am I deloading? I feel great. That's the point. You should feel yeah. good going into a deload. You should not feel broken down. You should not feel injured. You should not feel bad. That's the point of a deload. So you can continue making progress stronger. Now, depending on how you recover, what your total training looks like, it's different for everybody, right? If you're brand new to the gym, you could get away with even honestly, I was going to say eight to 12 weeks taking a deload week, but honestly, even more sometimes three to four months at a time with a deload week, especially if you're new and your intensity is not dialed in yet. Now, if you're advanced or in a deficit, meaning you're under fueling your body, I think that's an important route. I honestly think every four to six weeks implementing some style of deload, even if it's selective, Every four to six weeks is going to keep you going. I was going to say for advanced lifters, because you're usually your intensity is dialed in, but also if you're in a calorie deficit, just because you're not giving your body what it needs from a nutritional standpoint to recover from. So that's a big one. And that's where I'd say deloads have their place. And I, my body needs one every six weeks. I need one or at least selectively doing it. Be intentional. Do it before. Don't be an idiot like me and wait till you're injured to do it every time. This is all about prevention. This is recovery is all like you're not noticing these effect right when you're thinking about prioritizing recovery and really taking these steps it's about it is about the long game it's yeah. not something you're going to see instantly at all and it's why a lot of people don't want to do it it's really easy to ignore exactly. it's normal too you're already going to the gym you don't want to think of, you don't want to think about one more goddamn thing yeah. it's the easiest to sweep under the rug but it is it will in the long term it is going to have the biggest negative effect yeah. when it comes to like the cumulative impact of neglecting it. I, I personally think that's an opinion, but yeah. Think about a deload because so many people it's that narrow versus long-term vision. Yeah. If you're looking at it narrow in the terms of this week or this month, you'll make more progress by not deloading. But over the course of a year, that's not even that long over the course of a year, you'll probably make an insane amount more progress if you take and sprinkle a few deloads in there because you won't have those periods where you have a dragging shoulder injury or back injury that's limiting you for weeks or months at a time. That's yeah. the whole point of it. That's the whole point of it. Now, without preventative, I think a massive one that people realize now we're doing an entire episode on sleep in the near future. So we're not going to hone on this 
super, super long. But sleep, I think, goes along with nutrition for one of the mo- the biggest in the moment now recovery moments. Uh, yeah, I, I think if, this applies into the rest portion of the four R's of post-exercise yes. recovery. How did I forget the freaking four R's? <laughs> this, but it does. this is the rest. <laughs> this is the rest, but this is physically where your body recovers. I don't think people realize yeah. that. Sleep no. is where your body does so much recovering. Now, we're going to sum it up a little bit because we're going to go that full episode here in the near future, but decreases in sleep or poor sleep quality, this is going to lead to less muscle and more fat gained during a bulk. So if you're building muscle, you're eating in a surplus, you're going to gain more fat and less muscle if you're not sleeping as well. If you're in a fat loss phase or a deficit, you're going to lose more muscle and lose less fat in a deficit. So you're breaking down more muscle, you're storing more fat regardless. You're going to see reduced performance in the gym. And I think one of the biggest aspects, the things that are going around in your body 24-7, these hormones, you're going to see a massive drop in growth hormone and testosterone arguably two most anabolic hormones in your body. Now, this is the interesting part to me. As much as 75% of your total growth hormone that gets released in a 24-hour period is released during deep sleep, right? So let's, and these are not units at all, but this is just for an easy example. If you're going to release 100 units of growth hormone in a 24-hour span, around 75 of them are going to come in these pulses during deep sleep meaning that quality sleep, not just the light sleep, not just whatever it is, your deep sleep, right? Growth hormone is one of my favorites because you can kind of tell what it does by the name where most hormones you can't, right? It plays a critical role in all things growth, right? It plays a role in your body composition, cell repair, your metabolism, especially cell repair in joints and connective tissues and muscle tissue recovering from injury, training. Growth hormone is what puts these pieces back together. Right. And those are just those that's happening in these pulses during your deep sleep. Now, deep sleep and REM are the two. I think when people consider quality sleep, they look at how much REM you're getting and how much deep sleep. And we've talked about this before and we'll definitely more in depth in the future. Think of REM and they're much more complicated in this, but think of REM as almost recovery for your brain, your energy, your fatigue. Think as deep sleep as recovery for your body. The physical aspects of recovery come from deep sleep. Right. Now, we're going to talk about a few things you can do to increase this. And actually one of the biggest signs, and this is if you have like a cool aura ring, not a sponsor that we want to be a sponsor, but if you have a cool aura oh. ring, one of the big signs that you're overtraining, overworking is actually getting too much deep sleep. And I'll explain that here in a second, which actually surprised me because you need deep sleep and that can be a big problem too for recovery, but too much is also a little red flag. Now you collect the majority of your deep sleep in the first half night of sleep. So you're getting it all, all night, but the majority comes in the first half where the majority of REM sleep comes in the second half of your night of sleep. So you kind of want to emphasize this first half of sleep. Your heart rate and your breathing are at their absolute lowest rates. Your body is relaxed. Your muscles are fully relaxed. Your blood pressure drops and blood flow actually increases to muscle tissue, especially if you weight train that day and when growth hormone is released. Now, if you have a tracker, goals for deep sleep to make sure you're getting enough, it should aim to make up about 35% of your total sleep or really aim for around like an hour to an hour and a half plus per night is also a good goal to have in there. Now, if you don't track your sleep, there's a few signs that you can tell if you're not getting enough, which I don't shut up about it. So I'm going to try not to be a broken record. Like single best investment I think I've made for my health is this aura ring to track sleep better. And I want that, one but so bad. I need to get it. one. Write it off for text. Uh... I'm talking about it on the podcast. But if you don't track your sleep, there's a few things that you can do to tell if you're not getting enough. You're like, ah, I don't really know. If you are frequently waking up feeling less than refreshed or groggy, right? If the following day you are irritable, you're fatigued, you have a really hard time focusing. If you have a, this is a big one too. If you have a really in, sharp increase in hunger the following day, that's where those hunger hormones like uh, leptin mm-hmm. and ghrelin are largely regulated in deep sleep. Right. So if you're starving the next day, cause you're like, what the heck? It's probably cause you didn't get enough deep sleep. And then another big cue that's a little bit, you got to check your ego is if you, have, if you have a short temper the next day, right? If you feel yourself having a short temper, these are all signs of not getting enough deep sleep compared oh my to God, just I running. feel like how many people, when you're tired, you're pissy. 
Like, it's yeah. like, sorry, I'm tired. But I feel like people don't put two and two together. It's how many times yeah. is that an excuse of like, oh my God, I'm so tired. I'm sorry. And especially because some people will still sleep enough. Like they'll get like seven, eight, nine hours, but they'll still the feel quality. these things. And it might be the quality there that you're not getting the deep sleep. Now, here's how you increase this. And I do want to say this before you we get into this part. One of the biggest things I think is a red flag if you do have a tracker. And I'll even give like a little anecdote with my friend who actually is where I saw this in first, like I think a year ago is he was growing his business. He owned his own business, was growing that. So he was working an insane amount. He was training two a days in the gym, which I told him, don't be an idiot. Don't do that. But he was doing two a days in the gym, I think five, six days a week, and then working like every other waking hour of the day. He was getting like six hours of sleep at night. Of those six hours of sleep at night, he was getting like two and a half, almost three hours of deep sleep and almost zero REM. I'm saying like less than 10 minutes of REM sleep, but over two and a half hours of deep sleep. And that is one of the biggest red flags that you are over training, overworking is because his body is broken down. So his body's like, we do not have physically enough time to recover from what stimulus you're giving us through the day. You're giving us all this stimulus. We can't make up enough time. So sometimes you're like, oh, a lot of deep sleep. That's a good thing. Too much is a sign that you might be pushing it too hard right? During the day, pushing the envelope too hard during the day, mm -hmm. which I think is important. But for most people, it's not that problem. For most people, it's not enough that's helping them physically recover. And I'll tell you this, and you know how much more energy you have the next day after a good night's sleep. This would also give you, if you can really amp up the quality of your sleep, you can also handle a lot more stimulus through the day. You can handle harder training sessions. You can handle these things and push the envelope a little further if you do, right? A big thing, the biggest thing, and this is an easy one, that you can do to increase your deep sleep, lift weights, exercise. It's one of the, it's proven to be one of the most, the biggest things that can boost or increase the amount of deep sleep because your body needs something physically to recover from, mm -hmm. right? Earlier in the day does seem to help increase deep sleep a little bit, but I think that's more because if you're doing it right before bed, especially with caffeine, your body's just going to be up. You're not allowing yourself to fall asleep. So anytime exercise is going to help. This is actually the one that when I was going through and diagnosing where I need to fix aspects of my sleep, I've talked about it a few times before, heavy meals right before bedtime, right? One of the best things you can do that people don't think about is avoid eating a big meal within two to three hours of going to bed. And honestly, even the further away from that, usually the better. Like you need to burn energy to digest food. We know that, right? Same thing of when you're digesting food, when it's in your little tummy, a lot of your blood flow gets taken down to your midsection, right? To help that digestion process. But what if I need a little this. something sweet before bed, Tony? What if I need a I need little my snack? Little, oh, I always have my little something sweet. <laughs> little snack. I've been a good boy. <laughs> I need my I need dark chocolate. <laughs> but so that's the, so little things totally fine. It's the heavier meals that take hours to digest yeah. because that's going to keep your heart rate elevated for several hours. And if you don't know that, that's what humbling experience like the aura ring was, is my heart rate would be in like the 70s, 80s until like one in the morning. And I was going to bed at like 10. I was like, how the heck is this? It's because I ate right before bed. And I noticed as soon as I spaced it out and I eat like 5.30 now, 6 o'clock, my heart rate can actually drop That's down. That's so early. I know it's a little earlier, but I'm telling you, it's it made the biggest difference in my ability to fall into deep sleep. And my deep sleep shot up. Because, oh and, and again, it try not to have a big meal within two to three hours. If you're having a little yeah. meal, a snack, it's not that big of a difference. But if you're having a massive meal right before bed, I would be willing to bet your deep sleep is suffering quite a bit. Another My big sleep one. Was I didn't even think about it until like, honestly, now I'm just thinking about it. But when I was a waitress, because I would just come home at like 1130, haven't eaten anything. I'm scarfing down food, trying yeah. to go to bed. And I could, I'd be so tired, but I could never sleep. And I would always wake up so early, just feeling like dead to do it all over yeah. again. I'm like, what's going on? And that's yeah, so many wow. people like they'll get home, they'll go straight from work to the gym and they won't get home till like eight, nine o'clock and they'll slam a huge meal because they haven't eaten since lunch. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, why am I just sitting up at night? Yeah. Or why can't <laughs> I feel, why do I feel so groggy waking up? Mm -hmm. That's a reason, right? Anything that's going to keep your heart rate up is yeah, not allowing you to relax, fall into those deeper stages, which is where this next one comes from, right? It's just avoiding stimulants anytime close to bedtime, having a caffeine cutoff time. If you have any other stimulants through your day, right? Caffeine's a big one. I know I've had to keep breaking mine up forward and forward. Now I'm at like 11 a.m. I try not to have a caffeine afterwards. The earlier, usually the better, just because it stays in your body for so long. And then another big one, people forget is also a stimulant, is alcohol, right? Having that nightcap, that one, two drinks before bed, 
look at your, that's what killed me the most is having like a cocktail right before bed and then watching my sleep just suck butt. It ruins it. it one to uh, two drinks ruins your sleep quality, ruins it. So if you're one of those who, who needs a little nightcap, it's not helping you fall asleep. It might help you fall try asleep. Try reading. Helping the quality. It makes you really tired. Unless <laughs> you find a book. <laughs> unless you find cool a book that keeps novel. you up. But if the book keeps you up, it's that good. And then you're going to ruin your sleep. But sometimes if you're mindful, it makes you really sleepy. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm with you. Like it just calms me down. It's nice because it's also not yeah. a bright screen. It's not like a bright screen right in your face, mm -hmm. which is another one. Avoiding bright Crazy. Light. And another Crazy, big one for like... deep sleep, and this is one I've actually experimented more with recently, is acoustic stimulation actually has been shown to significantly increase deep sleep. I used to use pink noise. A lot of people use white noise as like playing on a speaker, but I've even started using, have you heard of binaural beats? What does brown noise fall under? I think brown noise is more for focus, but have you heard of binaural beats? No. Oh. It sounds funky. I'm not going to lie, but specifically delta waves in binaural beats. Binaural beats are essentially just waves. It sounds like really weird, like you're going to get pro binaural, oh, but okay. it's, it's creepy, but essentially they match the wavelength that your brain is in that state. So why certain binaural beats are used to focus and study is because it matches that frequency that your brain is when you're in like a hyper focus and delta specifically delta waves, where I know there's some soundtracks that are like a minute or two on Spotify that are delta waves. If you search delta waves for sleep binaural beats, you might find a couple that work. There's some weird ones with like some like mm -hmm. Indian chimes and stuff. I don't like those, but just those waves and those have been, oh my gosh, they throw me in deep sleep. Based. I don't know how I people sleep in Alexa. silence. Like I do not understand how people sleep in silence. Or even honestly, if you live in a place that has high noise, like I live in downtown San Diego, there's homeless people that'll scream and just randomly start hitting yeah. the wall at like two in the morning. <laughs> Those sounds, they do drown out external sounds. If you hear like mm -hmm. an airplane or live close to an airport or anything, it drowns out external sounds, which can really, really help because your body still senses those sounds, even though you're asleep. So that might be something that although you didn't wake up, it might've startled you to jump your heart rate up, which might interrupt your sleep. All right. So we're going to go deep into that in a future episode, but those are the main things you can really look for, especially the heavy meals before bed, the exercise. And then avoiding those stimulants, even honestly, avoiding long naps in the afternoon can be a big one too that we can dive into. But those are, are the big napper? things. Can you I nap? used to be a power napper, like 15 minutes, but I, it screws up my sleep for the next night. And then after reading a lot more of what's his name, Dr. Matthew Walker's work, he mm -hmm. even shows the best thing you can do, even if you got a bad night's sleep the night before, is not to nap or overcompensate yeah. with caffeine. It's to just stick it through the day and go to bed at your normal bedtime the next night. Usually naps do more harm than good, but. If I got like a long night or something like that, I'll take a power nap for sure. Power naps for sure. Can't Never do those been long a napper. ones. If it's 15 minutes, I don't fall like all the way asleep. I feel good. But if I fall all the way asleep, like 90 minutes, I'm in a different freaking mm -hmm. planet when I wake up. So those will help. But I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Supplement wise, nothing's going to be as good as the aspects we covered here. Not mm -hmm. BCAAs, not glutamine, no matter what they're trying to sell you. Protein shakes to help hit your protein goal if that's a People deal. still think BCAAs. When I was even like getting studies for so this stupid. and obviously like Google, it, it, people will list off like BCAAs. I'm like, what the f Yeah, it's still one of those things that just if you market it hard <laughs> enough, people just start to believe it. It's like, oh, it's like, no, the BCAAs will not help. That's a big thing is, oh, this helps so much with my soreness. I've heard that a hundred times. They'll start working out. That new stimulus makes them outrageously sore. So the next day they go buy GNC. And the person says, yeah, take these BCAAs to help. They start drinking it. They start getting less sore, not because of the BCAAs, but because it's no longer a novel stimulus. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I need my BCAAs. I need them. It's not that. It's not the point. And then the only other one would be creatine, which does reduce exercise-induced muscle damage, which adds mm -hmm. to soreness. So another reason why creatine is a goat. But, oh, my gosh, that was a freaking deep dive on recovery. I my know. Goodness. I feel like there's even more I could have recovered, but. Honestly, for real. Now, only a couple post notes. If you want to check out our complete 12-week push-pull leg training program, join Premium down below for just five bucks a month. That's literally less than a Starbucks cup of coffee. Five bucks a month and you get those weekly episodes on top of everything else. Any important links that we mentioned in the video will be down below. And we hope you have a productive week. Yeah, read a yeah. book. Go read a book. Do something new. <laughs> Shake it up a little bit. Do something. All right, we'll talk to y'all soon.